If you think about all of us at work, how much time we spend in expressing ourselves and creating, which is why it gives us real joy. And the question is, how much time do we spend just coordinating? And so if we can sort of really tilt that balance towards more creativity, I think we will all be better off. If you think about how you even recall meetings, sometimes you even have transcripts of meetings today. But it's not, I don't want to read through the entire transcript. I want to be able to say, what did Ilana say at, on this topic in the meeting? It's just a search away or a chat session away. So our ability to actually have what I'll call better recall, better information at your fingertips, all of these dreams which we've had for a long time is now that much more possible. And so I think that this is a tool that helps us manage our attention and time more efficiently and be more in control of how we work. Developers who are using GitHub Copilot are 50 odd percent more productive, staying more in the flow. We have around 100 million professional developers. We think the world probably can get to a billion professional developers. And so that'll be a massive uh, increase in total developers because the barriers to being a software developer are going to come down. This doesn't mean uh, the great software developers won't remain great software developers, but the ability for more people to enter the field will increase. So I think they there will be a way for us to reskill ourselves. To your point, always displacement is about picking up new skills. What if we reduce the barrier to picking up new skills right in the job that you're doing? And that's, I think, what's perhaps going to be different in this time around. The way I think about it is our mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. Every time I go to any country, any community, I meet these people who are part of the Power Platform community, and they all happen to have, you know, sometimes high school degrees, may not have college degrees, but are all participating in IT because it's br brought this revolution of low code, no code uh, to anyone so that they can participate with IT wages in the digital transformation of their organizations. Just imagine the barrier to even and that, which was Excel level skills, now has even come down because all you need to do is natural language prompts. One thing that I find very, very good about uh, the way the dialogue is happening this time around, right? So it's just not about tech optimism. It's about thinking about technology and its opportunities, but also uh, the responsibilities of the tech industry and the broader unintended consequences and how we mitigate them long before uh, they become sort of out there in the society, whether it's the standards. It's not even just principles in the abstract, but in the engineering process, even the design choice, Elena, to the we started, which is putting human humans in the center. It's a design choice. Uh, so I think us taking all those into consideration and doing some of our very best work to capture the opportunity and mitigate the unintended consequence, I think, is what's our responsibility. If you think about what we did even prior to all the generative AI and all of these co-pilots, if I think about what Microsoft did, like take in facial recognition. First of all, there are laws on the books around facial recognition and what are the right places to use facial recognition and not, or even neural voice. Right there, I think there are no laws yet, but we ourselves have put a lot of governors on how and who can use neural voice. So I do think that there is a place for dialogue and the dialogue, and there is also place for us uh, to take responsibility as purveyors of this technology before regulation and then expect that there will be regulation. I'm not particularly familiar with uh, that, that particular uh, comment on uh, what we may or may not be doing in Europe, but the fundamental thing I think is we, at the end of the day, European 
uh, Union and their regulators will do what is best for Europe and will participate in Europe within the frameworks of uh, the law and regulation. Here and now, for example, take bias, right? One of the key things is to ensure that when you're using these technologies that by some unintended way, some biased uh, you know, outputs are not causing real world harms. And so that's why we have to first, before we even talk about the usage, we have to think about the provenance of data. What are we doing to de-bias these models? This is where Microsoft's done a lot of work, whether it's in the pre-training phase or even after you deploy a model, how to ensure that you have the evaluation tests really ensure that the usage doesn't have bias. I think that there are two sets of things that are both important for us to have at least robust discussions, uh, and then at the ultimately it's for more the regulators and the governments involved uh, to take make these decisions. The first one is more here and now. How are the real world consequences of any AI being deployed? And then there is a second part, which I think also is worthwhile talking about, is what is the make, how do we make sure that any intelligent system we create is in control and aligned with human values? So it's not the first time we're dealing with complexity in the real world. Uh, and I don't think biology, biology, uh, environment. Uh, there's many things that we, ha we, we kind of observe. We try to get empirical results. We try to deal with it in such a way that we really get the benefits of what we're doing, right? I mean, the, and so therefore, I, I feel like we're quick to sort of talk about this as the last and frontier and the only technology. I think it's an absolutely un amazing set of technologies that are coming. All I want us to do as Microsoft is do the hard work. Do the hard work of making sure that the technology and its benefits far outweigh any unintended consequence.